Hey guys. Good morning. How's it going? Good. All right. Oh, there's no mic on Linux basics. I can't ask who that is. Can't believe I'm one of the first in. <laughs> I know you're early today. A long time ago, I learned that uh, when my calendar entry pops up to remind me of a meeting, if I I have to join right then, even though it's like ten minutes early, because otherwise something will come up and I'll forget them and I'll end up being late. Well, uh, I'm allowed to be slow. I have a used to be national commercial commercial for Heinz ketchup, where their whole uh, tagline was, <laughs> "It's so." Low. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's what you want to be known as. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was the other one, which is there's no other kinds once you've tasted Heinz. <laughs> that like that? Well, okay, no, no, maybe not. I don't know which yeah. one's worse, better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they were on national TV. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I guess with all the political correctness, neither one would be uh, shown today. Uh, yes, it's, it, it's funny. You go back and look at some of the movies. And I, I don't know how old you are, but at least when I go back and look at some of the movies that were out when I was a kid, like the original Bad News Bears, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they actually showed that because they could never show half that stuff today, on, on even, a, even on a movie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I am pretty old, actually. I'm 64. So. Okay, so you're older than me. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's fun. I, I, been, sorry, go, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say one thing that I find intriguing in the last couple of weeks is I discovered this uh, channel where it's uh, what they call pre code Hollywood movies, which were from before 1934. Uh huh. And uh, it's pretty amazing what they were showing. Um, you know, like just the, you know, violence and beating up women and, uh, you know, heavy drinking, and uh, uh, it's like, wow. They, they, and that was in the uh, 30s. By 34, a lot of that is cleaned up. But uh, even today with, uh, you know, our ratings, I'm wondering if uh, some of those might actually have to go to, uh, you know, the, uh, what is it, NC-17 MA yeah, or whatever they call it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. It, I think it would be really fascinating to, to take a group of people from back then and drop them in today's culture and take a group of people from today and drop them back in that culture and just watch the reactions from both sides. Cause, <laughs> yeah. cause, cause it's funny. You you that, yeah. Okay, oh, what was the name of the movie? It was with, um, I think it was with Sylvester Stallone. I, th I want to say demolition man, where he was like a cop frozen in time and then, and then. Yes. Yes. And they yep. were, and it was, they were completely making fun of the, you know, the PC world and stuff. And so I would love to, to see at what point we're going to end up being that movie, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just don't want that. Every restaurant is Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hey, Tommy. And who is Linux basic? I know that I think I've seen it before, but I can't remember who it was. Hi. Uh so um, I, I wrote uh, some student paper with Cloud Events. And yeah, I just want to, to see okay. yeah, how you Well, see. welcome. If you, if you type your name and the company you're with, if you want to be associated with a company into the chat, I'll add you to the, to the attendee list. Just we keep track of attendance. That way uh, people can get voting rights because we base voting rights based upon attendance. So if you're planning on join, joining on a regular basis, I'd love to add you to the attendee list. Yeah. And okay, cool. And Mr. Scott, hello. Good morning. Uh, Vlad. Good morning, Doug. Hello. And John Mitchell. Good morning. Hello. Da -da -da. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Linus. Oops. Oh, 
Hello. Hello, sir. And Ginger, hello. Good morning, Doug. Hey. Uh, Vladimir, are you there yet? Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Mark. Hey, Doug. Hello. That's Francesco, right? Yeah, it's me. Hello. Luckily, I recognized your uh, slinky developer name. <laughs> <laughs> Quite characteristic, right? <laughs> yeah, at least it, it stands out, put it that way. Yeah. So, for those of you who are new to the call, we'll, we usually start about three after just to give people a chance to join. When it will start? Three after, so another two minutes or so. Okay, okay. And uh, do you want to be associated with a company or just for yourself? Oof. That's a hard question. What my colleagues does? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, only reason, the only reason I'm asking is because voting rights are usually um, based upon attendance on the calls and stuff like that. And, and if there's someone else from your company who may join, then you may want to say, okay, either one of you can show up to get, uh, to get credit for showing up today. But if, it's, if you think it's only going to be you, then that's fine. We can just keep it as just you if you want to. Yeah, for today, let's do like that. I mean, okay, that's fine. I, I just, I, I, I'm just lurking inside this meeting. Uh, okay. <laughs> and frankly, I have, I have to go uh, quite early, so. <laughs> okay, not a problem. All right, let's see. Um, let's see if I can remember the names here. I think that's Elberk is uh, Lucas, right? Yes, okay. Uh, Ryan, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Hello. I have to leave a, a little bit early, too. Just heads okay, up. no problem. As long as you get that little star next to you, you're all good. Um, Mike, you there? Yep, I'm here. All right. I think I got everybody so far. Oh, Manuel. Yes, I am. Hi. Hello. And Jem, welcome. Thanks. And unfortunately, I will be here for the whole session. <laughs> Darn. Uh, uh, all right. Three after, why don't we go ahead and get started? Let's see. Wow. Small group today, only 17 people. All right. Um, let's see. AIs. Believe it or not, um, at least I don't know about Mark and Kim, but I'm at least thinking about this every now and then. So at some point we'll have some sort of some sort of proposal for what to do relative to us going to some SIG or creating a new one. Um, all right, community time. Uh, for those of you new to the call, this is just an opportunity for new people or community members to bring up topics um, that are not on the agenda, but they think may be worthy of a discussion on today's call. Um, so anybody have any topics they wanna to bring up? All right, cool, moving forward then. Uh, EU planning. So I believe well, relative to things that we need to let the, um, the conference organizers know about, I think for the most part, we're pretty much okay because we have speakers. I know that the work, the, uh, the workflow guys are still trying to figure out exactly who's talking, but we can worry about that later. The one thing I do want to talk about today, if possible, is the answer bar stuff. This is the, the booth thing. Does anybody have any preference for what we sign up for? You know, full time, half time each day, um, or basically random hours. Before I state what I was thinking, what, does anybody have any preference or ideas on which way to go with this? No. Okay, fine. I was thinking picking half time uh, for each day. We could alternate morning or afternoon. I thought full time might be a little hard in terms of finding people to actually staff it. And random just kind of bugged me because I don't feel like it's fair to people who actually do want to talk to us to not know for sure when we're going to show up and it might change 
But I figure if we can at least say we're there, you know, morning or afternoon on each particular day, at least gives a little more definitive time to people. Anyway, that was my thinking on the idea or the, the topic. What do you guys think? I'm going to pick on people. Okay, fine. I'll pick on someone. I'm going to pick on Mark. I haven't picked on you in a while. Mark, you have any thoughts on this? No, because uh, I won't be going, so I don't have. Uh, <laughs> Darn. I, I, I could give you my opinion, but I'm not going to be there to uh, deal with it. Okay, fine. Let me pick on people who actually signed up here. Uh, Vlad, let me pick on you. Any thoughts on this? Uh, I agree that random is annoying. As a, an attendee, it would be absolutely terrible not knowing when people are there. So definitely not random. Full time would be rather intense. So half time sounds good to me. <laughs> I mean, okay. Uh, who wants to mend the cask or be there? Right. We need a list of people first to see, could we do full time? It might be nice, but I don't know if we're going to get the people. Yeah, so, so for, the, for the people who are listed up here, um, do you guys think you will be able to staff the booth at least partial time? Like Clemens, Scott, uh, Klaus? Yes, sometime, definitely. Okay. But I can give several hours. Okay. But I don't really want to be there the, the whole time. Right. Come like, in, like, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. I mean, if possible, I would uh, I would love to sign up for like a single four hour slot. Okay, well, I think it's definitely doable. So, okay. I agree with Clemens. What Wait, Clemens? Sorry, not Clemens. <laughs> you mean Scott? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, I'm not hearing anybody jump up and down, being too overly excited about full you know full time coverage. Um, so I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like we're leaning more towards um, half days. Does that sound yeah. fair? Yes, time slices. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I think that the real question then is we just need to figure out whether we want morning or afternoon each of those days. And um, I'll figure out some way to, for us to sort of vote or do something about that. I'll probably just put together a, a spreadsheet or something and. And you guys can fill your names in. We'll figure it out. Hey, Doug, I have a suggestion. Yes, please, Scott. Please. Go okay, ahead. let's let's do this. We'll do half time. We'll do a.m. the first day, p.m. the second day, a.m. the third day. Done. What do you think? Any objection? All right. I'm I'm going to make a comment, even though I won't be there. Uh, that uh, you may want to staff it during the uh, busy time when there are parties going on, which is probably the PM-ish time on Tuesday. So we could do this. But that's that's just me. No, I, I think I think considering the the PM on Tuesday is the booth crawl, it would be really nice to have somebody there. Yes. What do people think? I was aiming for that morning Tuesday hype period where there's not a bunch of beer. <laughs> it was the only the only AM Tuesday, and then we get to avoid like the six or eight hours of Tuesdays requirements. Because Tuesdays like double the day. Yeah, but doesn't it feel a little bit awkward to miss out on booth crawl? Are you? Who's going to bring the beer to the booth? I'm sure we could find some way to get you a beer, Scott. <laughs> no, it'd be fun to like talk to people about that during that too. Yeah, it's a good point. I, I just don't. Fight. I just don't want to do Thursday PM because that's when the uh, swag run happens. People are exhausted. People don't want to be there anymore. Right. I, I think AM on Thursday makes sense. I think PM on Tuesday makes sense because the booth crawl. Um, Should. Why don't we tentatively say Tuesday all day and we can see if we can get three people to do four hour slots. 
what do people think about that idea? You guys are killing me today. <laughs> <clears throat> Could we confirm how many people we have? Like, I'm up for a four-hour slot. Scott is up for a four-hour slot. That is true. We probably Let's don't have many... one person. Right? You, you might want two during the booth crawl, just because it tends to be pretty busy. So the only thing is, I would have to go back and check with them to see if we could do all day on Tuesday. Because okay. they didn't give us that choice, right? It was either AM or PM or full time. I see. Well, um, then let's keep it like this and, and we'll roll with that. So okay. Split it up into four hour chunks and we'll start doing assignees. Okay. When is the face to face? Can... Uh, if we have, well, uh, we don't know yet. It depends on when okay. they get the room. Yeah, I just was wondering if it, um, I mean, it shouldn't block with the uh, booth. Hopefully not. Uh, Ginger, were you going to say something? I was going to say also, there's nothing that says you can't be at the answer bar, even if it's not your specified time. Like it's a, it's a little section and there's people milling around all the time. And if for some reason they have an empty booth and you decide that you want to be there, then you can always stick your name up there and be there. So is it, in, in those kind of situations, is there like a, uh, a cloud of, would there be like a cloud events, like logo or, or something to make it clear that I'm standing here because of cloud events? Yes, for well for San Diego anyway, they they boo booed and did not have logos, which was problematic. So unfortunately it was just a plain white sign with the name of the project. Um mm -hmm. it still worked, but it was a little unfortunate. Um so I was told by Katie that they were gonna fix that for the next one. So hopefully it will have logos and everything, but they put them up with like Velcro. So if you only have part-time, then they'll split your time with another project maybe. And so they'll change the sign out depending on who's supposed to be there. Right. Okay. Okay. But that, that's a good point. We could, we could technically just crash. Um, okay. But as of right now, I think this is what we're going to head for. Right. So I should tell them option two and then PM AM AM is the plan. Does that sound right? Okay, not hearing any objections. Let's go with that. Uh, let me just think, make sure I'm not missing anything else. Can anybody else think of anything else relative to KubeCon that we need to talk about? Okay, uh, one thing, uh, Clemens, I thought I sent you a note, but I might have forgotten. Can you send me your title that you want? Um, I need to let them know you're a speaker and they, they're gonna ask for your title. In my job title? Yeah. Chief Messenger. <laughs> <laughs> send me a note of what you want to really say. Chief Messenger. Okay, fine. Fine, fine, fine. Okay, anything else for KubeCon? All right, um, SDK call. We didn't have one last week, so nothing to update us on. I do believe we're on schedule to have a call today, assuming people want to talk. So hang on after the call if you're interested. Um, relative to the Rust SDK, uh, just this morning I did hear back from these folks um, who were students at some university, I believe, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> and they are interested in contributing. So I was gonna try to get a conversation going between those folks and uh, Francesco to see about whether it makes sense to try to merge these efforts and stuff like that. Um, so I don't wanna try to ask for a vote yet because we don't know exactly which project would come forward or whether it be both kind of a thing. So I um, wanna have those discussions offline first before we bring that back to the group here. Assuming everybody's okay with that. Um, but um, bum, bum, what else? Okay, Kathy, I don't see Kathy on the call. Oh, Kathy, you're on the call. Kathy, is there anything you'd like to update us on relative to the workflow subgroup? Kathy, you still there? Okay, maybe she set the way for a sec. We'll circle back around. Let's go ahead and jump over to the cloud description stuff. And Mike, please, you wanna go first? I always have trouble unmuting in Zoom. Um, <laughs> I think this is the beginning of some of your new. Yeah, things. so I, I updated the, this doc to just reformat a little bit. And turn, like we had the use cases shoved down in the querying event producer section. Um, we hadn't written goals. Um, so that that's stuff that I wrote came out of my head, probably needs review from others. Um, 
one thing that I wanted to point out is below the querying event producer, I added a new start of a section called registering with a producer or an aggregator. Um, and I'm wondering if we should think about a protocol um, to advertise that you produce uh, events that can be discovered. Maybe it's a little circular here, but thinking about um, uh, a common, a really common use case that that I hear from um, the customers that I talk to is, uh, you know, they're writing systems that they might receive an event that is triggered by some outside system. A file was uploaded to a cloud storage system. A database record was updated. Um, but then they want to turn around and uh, emit another event. So, um, you know, a concrete use case, uh, an, an image gets uploaded, they do some ML on that, and maybe have, you know, three events that are emitted that are the bounding boxes of interesting objects. Um, so being able to have the production of, of those events and the consumption of those events fit into the same discovery and subscription system that events coming from the cloud storage system, I think is a useful thing to think about. So um, haven't talked to anybody about this, so I would love to get feedback from folks and see if this is something we should explore further. Um, fr from the from the subscription subscription API side, there's clearly a um, a need for a need for having these um, uh, the discovery uh, registry, wh whatever we're going to call this thing, um, uh, federated in a way that you can um, that effectively anybody who's who's interested in subscribing has a registry with all the interesting events somehow in reach, and uh, and in reach means uh, within their um, uh, networking uh, scope. Um, which which means in many in many cases that um, somehow we have to figure out how to propagate um, uh, those event registrations um, from the producer to some middleware. So that that is already the the first um, uh, case that you, that that you have here, where you have a event producer is delegating the subscription management to a middleware. That means that the producer at that point when it registers, when it basically announces, I'm going to go and publish events to that middleware, it also needs to go in and advertise which events are going to be um, published. And then if you have this multi, a multi-level distribution where you have, let's say a scenario where you have an, a producer, which is a device, which publishes to an intermediary, which is an IoT gateway that sits somewhere behind a firewall that then in turn goes and publishes out into a cloud IoT system, uh, cloud IoT uh, infrastructure, that effectively anything that can be raised by that IoT gateway um, must then be further down published into the cloud gateway so that if there's a downstream consumer that sits at the cloud gateway can know what's available from the devices that are upstream. So there's some propagation of, of, of advertising data that needs to happen in some way. That's a good use case. I think it'd be interesting to, for me to think on that a little bit more. Yeah, so, so effectively, we, have, we know already that we have the problem that you need to subscribe and, and Klaus raised this uh, first, um, uh, two weeks ago, where um, you are just, you are subscribing to events that are on the middleware that is, are not raised by that middleware, but that are raised upstream, and then exactly this eventing domain idea, and um, uh, where you are, um, you know, you're just you're subscribing from this in this big picture. You're the event consumer, and now you want to have a an event that is raised by, you know, one of the producers which are on the other side of that link outside of that box. And the question is, how does that happen? How do, first, how do we propagate the subscription? Um, and that's one thing that's kind of in the subscription API part and you know, how do we make this so that we can go and propagate, but then also how does that consumer even know that um, the green thing that sits outside of that box uh, in one of those other domains um, can, uh, uh, can raise that event? So there has to be some advertising propagation that's happening.
and that arguably goes first. Before you can subscribe, there has to be um, knowledge about those uh, events being available. Get back up there. Anybody else want to comment on this topic here? So, Jim, go ahead. Oh, I'll take a stab. So, I, I agree with what Clemens is saying, and I think that does all have to happen internally. But I wonder, you know, if you take a client-centric view to, to this uh, capability, all of that should be hidden from them. Yeah. So, for instance, yeah, if if we were emitting um, our current webhook event stream, you know, using cloud events. Um, and obviously today you, you know what it is, so you would actively subscribe to it. But um, you don't need to know all the component domains within PayPal that actually are producing those events. Yeah, you're just, from a client perspective, you're just subscribing to a stream. So I, um, without sort of dismissing what Clemens is saying, I, I, I wonder if that's going down into the weeds a little bit. Um, but obviously, you know, you guys that have cloud infrastructure to deal with is um, maybe you're coming at it from a slightly different angle than maybe I would, if you get what I mean. Ryan, your hands up next. Yeah, I was just going to add, in addition to, um, and, and forgive me if this was this was stated and I missed it. Um, in addition to the um, events being, um, you know, sort of, I guess centrally or, um, or uh, consumable um, by um, through some middleware um, that isn't the actual producer of the event. Um, I think uh, we are interested in, in having the same sort of model for discovery as well. We want, um, we have uh, at Twilio, we have all of these different systems, all these different products that all are going to be, you know, generating events. Um, but uh, we want one place for clients to know what those events are and, and how to go and get them. Yeah, so it's, you know, so I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I wasn't saying that that function doesn't need to exist. I, I'm just wondering what it needs to exist in the spec. You know, that, that sort of internal aggregate, publish, republish, you know, delegated subscriptions, all that sort of thing is more of an internal concern, um, unless I'm not understanding the comment correctly. So my, my hands up next. Um, yeah, for some, from my point of view, I, I, I can definitely see a, def, a, a use for this kind of thing, because especially with other systems that like we have within IBM, we want to try to promote the notion of self-registration for things, right? When you bring on new services or whatever it is, you don't want to have some, someone or some process be a bottleneck, right? You want that new service to be able to register itself automatically. And so having standardized APIs and mechanisms to make that happen just makes everybody's life easier. My only um, concern and concern might be too strong of a word is whether that would be part of this piece of work or a secondary piece of work. Cause I think as Jim is saying, it feels a little bit like you're talking about a different, um, a different uh, role or user would use these APIs, right? Cause the subscription and the discovery stuff, that's all in essence, you know, event consumer is going to be using those things. And this is more like an administrative kind of thing or, service provider kind of a thing. At least that's the way I'm thinking of it. Anyway, uh, Klaus, your hands up next. Yeah, so I think it just becomes relevant as soon as you wanna also achieve interoperability between those eventing components. So, I mean, we are, we are running our infrastructure on top of other infrastructures. And so we have uh, naturally also some need for interoperability there. Anybody else want to comment on this? Um, I think I, I, I kind of agree with Jen. I think, you know, we this is a kind of central um, 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 definition from one point of view, right? So it's only clear about um, development and yeah, Kathy, I wasn't sure it was just me yeah. enough, but you're, you're breaking up really, really badly. You have a very, very, oh, really? very poor connection. Yeah. Oh, is it now? Is it better now? Oh, yeah, actually oh. it is. Yeah, that is better. Oh, okay. Um, so, I, I, okay. Um, I tend to agree with Jim. 
I think you know um we need to start with the sequential um way to do all this simulation with AI. So it's like a oh, you're breaking up you're you're breaking up again, Kathy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Then maybe I should just call in again. Uh, yeah. I don't know what happened. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Sorry about that, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment on this or on the above section that Mike added up here? Okay. Anything else relative to the discovery section people want to bring up or talk about? So it, um, as a next action item, I was going to try to put together some example API calls in addition to what we have there. Um, it, it helps me think. <laughs> if anybody would like to help with that, that would be awesome. Are you, are you guys having regular phone calls? To, to uh, we're not. If if you if you would advise that we should, I'm happy to to schedule that as well. It's up to you guys. Every you know, as long as the work is done, I don't you know I don't care how it gets done. I I was just wondering um, whether you guys are having you know offline discussions among the four of you to to figure out what goes in the doc. Up to you guys how you want to work. I just I was just curious. Okay. Yeah. Um, in that case, Clemens, you want to take us up to or bring us up to speed on where you are with your section? Uh, yeah, we left um, except for addressing your objection on uh, producer and consumer. Uh, sorry, no, on producer and intermediary. Um, which you made a comment about, about the section uh, code, uh, the, the text being repetitive God. Um, I then continued kind of a little bit further down, if you would scroll a little bit. Um, not here, not here, not here, even further down and in creating subscription. So um, I have, um, I have done the unspeakable and I have pasted a URI temporarily to a W star spec. Um, and I apologize for that, specifically to you, Doug. I, I loved it personally. I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is for the younger, for the younger amongst us. <laughs> um, so this, so the, I have pasted the W as eventing spec specifically because that is literally the prior art, and so W is because W is eventing does quite literally exactly the same thing as uh, we're, what we're trying to achieve here. So um, uh, this is a great point of reference from a, from a term terminology perspective um, and also kind of from an information model perspective, um, even though like all the W star specs, um, W's eventing suffers a little bit from being, um, uh, from enjoying abstract abstraction and not getting concrete enough. Um, but um, uh, so I pasted this as a point of reference um, and also to uh, justify the, the term of a subscription manager. Um, and uh, I basically put this in so that the, the rest of the folks who are working with this um, have also, um, uh, you know, can read this once and kind of know what has been done 15 years ago about the same topic um, in standardization. Um, so for the subscription per se, we have not gone so far to bind that to a protocol. Um, and um, the, uh, but we have uh, worked on the, um, I have, I've worked on, and we all have worked on the uh, uh, information model. Um, because uh, the sync URI, which I took from your description, um, Doug, and where I think we still want to go and change that name to um, target or something else, um, because that is not sufficient for um, the URI itself or the scheme of the URI itself is not sufficient to indicate what protocol you're speaking. Um, specifically, there's stuff like, like WebSocket bindings for protocols, which make the URI WSS, and then you can't tell whether that's you know, MQTT or whether that's AMQP because effectively you learn, the client will learn about this as the, um, as the, the sub protocol is offered. Um, we need to have a special indicator for what the protocol is supposed to be. And so we have a protocol indicator 
um, MPP, and then MQTD3, MQTD5, HTTP, MQTP, Kafka, and NATS. Um, I've separated MQTD3 and MQTD5 out here. I'm not sure whether I'm going to go keep this. Then um, for all the protocols, for the particular protocols, there will be protocol related settings. There is, um, we're going to scroll down in a moment, not yet. Not yet. Um, and uh, so those will effectively indicate all the things that are relevant that are specific to um, the chosen protocol and that endpoint. Um, and uh, then um, the sync might be the endpoint. And then the, the, config, the, the config map uh, that was there already will, might then hold um, information that is not protocol specific, but related to that subscription. Um, you could think of as a retry um, count or retry duration. We haven't really thought of, um, you know, through what that might mean, but uh, that is an interesting um, thing to keep there. Whether we're going to go and take the protocol settings and the config and fold them on top of each other or something, we're going to go and see. And then um, we all know that there, we need to have filters. Um, and uh, we have uh, decided that we will want that we will write a section about the filters um, that will initially just cover some very simple ones um, related to the existing cloud events properties. So we're likely covering subject, source, um, and type uh, with the prefix, suffix, and uh, a direct match filter as a as a start. And we can still think of whether we need to have something that's a little bit more sophisticated. If you scroll down one, um, and then for the protocol settings, um, there are, um, I, I filled out two sections of the uh, ones that we need, um, which should illustrate what I mean with protocol settings. So for MQTT, you might have an endpoint URI, which simply points to the broker. And then in the protocol settings, you, you've, um, uh, define what the topic name is that you want to go and send to. Then you will define whether you want to have the quality uh, cost level of zero, one, or two for MQTT, whether you want to set the retain flag, what the expiry of that message is, um, whether you need to have the correlation data uh, header set, and whether you need to have extra user prop, which uh, might be used for dispatching inside of the MQTT broker in some way. And then for Kafka, similarly, we need to have a topic name, that we want to send to, then we have uh, defined in our protocol binding, we have to find um, that we want to go and select the, uh, the key partition ID um, using a selector. Um, and that selector needs to live somewhere. So this is the, the place where that would live um, in the configuration model. And then whether you want to set a client ID explicitly, um, what your ACK level is that you're expecting here and whether you want to have any retries. And uh, there's, more for other protocols and um, that we can go and set. And um, Klaus has volunteered to start filling out um, some of those things until our next meeting next week. So that's how far we got. Very cool. Any questions or comments for Clement? Oh, hey, Jim. Hey, no, no this is cool. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, is commenting on this doc um, the the sort of way to get questions in uh, or commentary in? Um, and the other thing is, from a subscription perspective, uh, and this is going to go down a bit of a rabbit hole, but you know, um, our customers, you know, so they would need OAuth to be able to talk to our subscription endpoint um, to discover what they might be able to subscribe to, but for then us to deliver stuff to them, we would probably need OAuth to them as well. So the um, the subscription is a bit of a handshake, yeah, where the client is saying, in this instance, yeah, please deliver to this endpoint. And by the way, maybe here's some credentials that you need to use to establish that connection. Is that the sort of stuff that you would be covering in the um, th those other sort of uh, config maps. Yeah, so there was a there was an explicit explicit credentials field which I cut for right now. Okay. Um, because we need to go. And, we have to we have to figure out how to do this holistically because all these um, there's there's a bunch of different scopes that collide, 
and uh, for which we have to have a, an idea of how to, um, to manage those. Because it, yes, there's a, quite a bit of the dance. There's the discovery question of you know, who can talk to the discovery service. The discovery service might be living completely elsewhere from where the subscription endpoint is. Because the, the discovery service is kind of like DNS. Um, and you know, that has publishing things over there is uh, um, different from actually being able to subscribe. Then the subscription service needs to, have a, needs to have a different authorization scope. And then of course, when you subscribe, then you need to go and pass the, the subscription manager basically some kind of a, um, authorization um, grant to then talk to that endpoint. And uh, that might be, if we're agreeing on OAuth, then you would probably go and pass a refresh token um, with uh, a, a, new, a renewal with you know, where you need to know what to go and renew that token or to actually get the access, the access token. Um, so that's all kinds of security stuff that we have to go and figure out how to do this. And yes, OAuth 2 is my, clearly would be my preference um, to deal with all that dance, with that dance. Well, I think we also need to have a pedestrian version that um, literally deals with username and password credentials because uh, in very many areas, it, I think that's still where we are. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I, um, it, there, there's obviously some um, commonality between this and the webhook spec, yeah, because that today sort of describes how that endpoint is meant to behave that I would be sending stuff to. Um, so... Okay, no, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the webhook spec the webhook spec that we have is effectively um, the the way how we normalize HTTP for, for push delivery, right? Right. That, yeah. And that already says here's a token. Um, and uh, please use that token in the authorization header. Now the question here is why well, creating a subscription, how do you get that token there? And is and is that token that you give to the subscription manager one that it can use directly, or is that one that the subscription manager first needs to go and trade for um, uh, a an actual access token? Yeah. And and my I'm inclined for since those things need to be long lived, those subscriptions uh, potentially that there is a refresh token rather than an access token that's being traded. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool, thank you. And um, but to the first point, is commentary on the doc. Uh, the right way, or have you guys Absolutely. got a separate Slack channel? Uh, no comment on the doc. On the doc. Okay. Cool. All right. Cool. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, Ryan, you're up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, add a comment to the the auth piece. Um, there are other um, ways of granting access that uh, don't um, where where auth might not make sense uh, in. Uh, in the negotiation um, when creating a subscription or sending events. So for example, you know, a lot of cloud vendors, as you're all, all familiar with, um, uh, have access control mechanisms that sort of fall out of band of, of all of this. So um, you know, Amazon Kinesis, right? Um, if I wanted to grant access to that, I can do that through IAM. Um, and that sort of bypasses the need to do auth in mind. Yeah, uh, yeah but you still, there's still a token flow. Is that true? Yep. Hmm. Okay. So all the I'll uh, so, to... so for instance, so for instance, we have. Um, I'm, I'm not 100 percent familiar with how AWS does it, but um, in um, but I think they do this in a, in a similar way. But in so in Azure, you have these um, managed managed uh, service identities, um, which are effectively the identity of the process that you're executing. And then you can talk to one of our managed services and it looks like you don't have to go and pass a credential, but all the magic is done under the covers. Ultimately, you st your client still gets a, gets a token and passes the token. You just don't see it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with how Azure does it, but I can read up and uh, get a better understanding for myself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, Heinz, your hand's up next. Uh, yeah, just wondering why the uh, um, desire to add to the subscription details that have to do with physical authentication and such to the brokers, because 
you'll probably be opening a can of worms. It's already mentioned was the access controls, but you'll also need to know things like which broker can I connect to, which can't I connect to, where I might have multiple subscribing, but because of access controls between brokers for route. I mean, I assume the messaging layer will automatically do that. From the event perspective, all I think that uh, uh, would be relevant would be what is the event so I know how to serialize and deserialize over the messaging, and what are the topics that those events are actually flowing across. The rest, I think you might be opening a can of worms that you don't want to go down that path, not just from the uh, protocol specific, but because this will work in things other than maps and Kafka and everything else, you'll suddenly be telling all of them, don't use this because we have all these protocol specific clients and authentications and, you know, it's going to get into what about Kerberos and PKI and, I mean, you might want to avoid it because is it really necessary for subscription management, discovering of subscriptions, and getting enough information to actually publish and subscribe or however you want, what message exchange pattern you want to use. So the, the, the goal of this API is to tell someone to deliver events to you. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a foreign party and you want to tell that foreign party to, to deliver events to you and you have an endpoint in your system. That's the, that's the goal of, the, that's the goal of, this, of this API. So it's for push style subscriptions where someone has events and you want to walk up to them and subscribe so that they will deliver events to you. That means that you make an endpoint available and that endpoint available may be, may not be HTTP, but it might be one of those other protocols. And therefore you have to go and configure that relationship. There is no, there is no out of band magic um, that you could establish that would make the thing interoperable if you don't communicate all the details. But uh, you are again um, asking for a client to a consumer to producer direct relationship, which is completely against eventing with event brokers where they are completely decoupled and the producers and the consumers are anonymous to each other. So that, Why would you want to suddenly bind them together so in some relationship? True. So that's not true. So if you if you go and and uh, and you pro product example, if you use Azure Event Grid, in Azure Event Grid, the producer produces into into a topic in Azure Event Grid. It knows nothing but Azure Event Grid. But if you if you want to subscribe to Azure Event Grid, which is a push delivery channel, then you need to go and provide to Event Grid. You need to provide an endpoint. HTTP or, or um, uh, one of our built-in ones, service bus, et cetera. And then you need to provide a um, connection string or you need to provide a with, which contains all the information like the credentials, and which contains the correct address and the port, et cetera, all the information that, that is required for event grid to know where it needs to go and connect to, to go and, uh, um, uh, and deliver. And that contains the, the protocol information and everything. Take a basic MQTT broker yes. that is completely anonymous um, and almost every event broker are using decoupled yeah. uh, producers from consumers, uh, including services such as persistence in that because you don't know if the downstream consumers are even online and really don't even care. And that, that's so, you're, describing, you're describing pull, the pull model which we are describing is, uh, Doug, if you scroll up a little bit more, which we, which we define right here. So we say there's two fundamentally different types of subscriptions. One is pull, where you walk up to a, um, an intermediary and the intermediary is delivering events through, um, your, um, through that channel and we're describing exactly how that works in MQTT and MQP and NAS where you are effectively using the mechanisms that are in that broker. But the, what, this, what this particular method, particular API that, we've, that we're defining in that, on the next page is about is, how, is if 
the, if that mechanism is not available in a broker, when there is no message broker that allows you for, pull, for pulling events out, then there needs to be push delivery and push delivery necessarily requires the, the subscription manager to connect out. And for connecting out, it uh, needs all that information. Uh, in that case, I think it might be a nomenclature issue. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, from all the work that we've done in the past, to me, push model is asynchronous eventing and pull is synchronous. So it sounds like uh, your definitions might be a little reversed. I'm wondering if we might want to come up with something a little different where those terms are kind of overloaded because I I, I would see the exact opposite of so, what I've always seen as the definitions. So pulling. Pulling is I go and I, get I, something. I don't, I don't understand how this is synchronous versus asynchronous. Pulling is I go and get something like polling. Yeah, okay. Push is I'm asynchronously delivered something where I'm waiting for somebody to send it to me, which is normally what event brokers do, right? when they're completely decoupled. Well, pull, pull, pull basically just means that you are, you're creating, pull, pull means that you're creating an outbound connection into the broker. And then you're soliciting messages from, uh, you're soliciting messages from there. And push. The events themselves are push or pull, not the client connection. I, I assume you always want things to do, be from the perspective of the event. I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, at the uh, perspective of the application programmer generally. And from their perspective, when they walk up to a broker, they say receive actively when they use a pull model. And, uh, and that's, the, that's, that's generally what, what pull is, like you receive something actively. And with yeah, push... They make, they make something available that, act, that actively listens and then something shows up, which means stuff is being pushed to them. Yeah, that's true in a REST model. That's not true in an event broker. In an event broker, everything is done from the perspective of the broker, which means is the broker pushing or pulling? It has nothing to do with but even, but even connecting that, to the broker. Yeah, yeah, but... Trust since me, I've been doing this with 25 years with message brokers. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I, just just because I don't want to run it completely out of time, I'm wondering, Heinz, whether it would make sense for you to add some commentary to the spec itself so that, they, so that your perspective can be taken into account as they start, you know, hashing on this. Yeah, again, my only suggestion is to use term other than pull and push because they're overloaded terms. They're not really computer science terms. Um, so I think it's the term where I agree with what Clemens has for his definitions. I just don't agree that push and pull are common enough that I'm using, I have the exact reverse. What he's saying is true, but I reverse what I call a pull and a push when I do eventing from event brokers. Okay, and so it sounds like- documentation, all our blogs, all that is exactly reversed. Right, so it sounds like it might be a, a, a um, a wording type of issue. Um, exactly. So maybe, so maybe you could offer up either some additional text or to put these words in the right context or offer up different words besides push and pull and then that could be part of the discussion. Exactly, and the common terms that we generally seen are synchronous versus asynchronous. Yeah, but, but synchronous versus asynchronous is, is in my mind something completely different. Asynchronous, right. syn synchronous, synchronous is really you, if you are, if you're, um, you know, initiating an operation and you, you um, get an immediate result, you're basically waiting for a result. And asynchronous is if you're initiating an operation, do, go do something else and then later um, the, event, the, the result either comes to you or you go pick, pick the result up, which means you can do an asynchronous completion either using pull or using push. Those things compose. It's not, it's not, well, it's not those are different things. Well, maybe you can describe it then by message exchange pattern, which is request reply versus publish and subscribe. Those are also. Yeah, but that's, that's not what I mean so, here, right? So a pull subscription, a pull subscription is also when you go walk up to an MPTT broker and you say subscribe, this is that you, you tell that the MPTT broker to send you a message 
whenever a message shows up, and this might be a thousand messages that are coming to you, and you've, but that's still a pull because you have opened up a connection into that broker, and then the broker is now serving on that pipe, is serving you messages, which means you've done- Yeah, so it's pushing you messages. You're not pulling them from the broker. The broker's yeah. pushing them to you. And no, but there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a clear difference between that activity and you telling, you're telling a subscription manager to go and open up an MQTT connection, right? And then using the, pub, the publish operation against that endpoint, because that is the push thing. Pushing means, pushing means in, in this definition is that the subscription manager actively goes and opens up a connection and starts sending events. So this is the difference in, in MQTT, the difference between the subscribe operation and the publish operation. Okay, I, I, I'm going to call time here. <clears throat> I actually think you guys are in agreement. It's a wording issue. Maybe yeah, I'm wrong. Exactly. I, I, yeah. So, so, so let, let's, let's end this discussion. And, and Heinz, can you offer up some, some alternative text as commentary in the doc itself? And that way, you and Clemens can go back and forth offline. Well, actually, it might be easier if I do it back and forth with Clemens, because we could come up with 10 different suggestions until we hit on one. So that That's fine. That's fine. However you want to do it is fine. I'm just trying to move forward in this call right now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Done. Cool. All right. So, Jim, you get the last word on this before we move on. Okay. So, uh, actually, I was going to disagree with with Heinz until I actually read the stuff that we're looking at at the moment. And and I think when I hear the heard the words push and pull um, from a again, I'll put myself in the shoes of a client. Yeah. Um, for me, a pull, um, and this is a use case we have today, is where a client comes to us and says can you give me all the events that are due to be sent to me? So it's literally them coming and saying, give me a block of events. You know, so that's them coming and pulling the information from us, us. Whereas a push model is where a client says, you know, please push events to me on this endpoint. Yeah. And so that, so the, the terminology is slightly different because in a pull model, um, the subscription manager doesn't deliver any events. All it does is buffer them up until somebody comes and pulls them. So um, I'll stick this in the notes, uh, but that was that was sort of my terminology. Okay, thank you, Jim. So any 30 second other topics or questions for Clemens about the, the text that he uh, went over? Okay. In that case, I'd like to see if maybe we could close out some of the PRs that are open. So let's go to the first one here. And just for my survey's memory, this is for the cloud event spec. Um, the original issue, there we go. Just to refresh everybody's memory, the person who opened this one up was complaining or questioning about some of the limits we had in the spec, like the 64K thing, whether that was a hard limit or just a recommendation. So what I ended up doing was adding some text in here, and I believe he gave a thumbs up to it, so he was okay with it. Um, basically, adding some text to the primer, saying that these aren't hard requirements, they're just um, recommendations, and if you wanna go outside the recommendations, you're fine, but then you gotta make sure all the hops in the message path are ready, are prepared to deal with it. Any questions on this? Any objection to approving? All right, thank you. This one, Vlad, are you still on the call? Yeah, Vlad, I think you took a look at this one, right? I don't remember. Oh, no, it was Fabio. I'm sorry, I got you messed up with Fabio. So this one, there were, he updated our JSON schema. Um, for the Jason pseudo experts on the call, have you guys had a chance to take a look at this one yet? Like Scott, did you take a look at this one? Because I'd love to get your opinion on because I know you've touched on stuff close to the space. I have not. Do you want time to look at this or? Yeah, sure. Can you can ping me in the issue? Yeah, the, okay. The PR. Okay. okay, we'll do. I feel bad it's been waiting so long, but I don't want to rush this one because um, I don't want to screw people up if they have uh, a uh, tooling that's uses this stuff. So, okay. Um, all right, administrative stuff. This one's fun. <clears throat> so 
Last week's call, I mentioned potentially changing the governance stock to talk about how you can be added or removed from the list of admins with a greater than 50% vote. Um, that's basically what this says right here. So you can be added or removed, just open a PR to either add yourself or remove yourself. Um, the normal voting rules that we have in general are greater than 50% anyway, so didn't need to say anything special there. The only tricky part is, well, what if someone wants to get you know, wants to leave that group on their own, not get voted out, you know, voted off the island kind of a thing. Um, basically, it's the same thing. You can, as long as you're not the last one, you can just open a PR um, and you can do a self merge because we can't force you to stay. Um, however, if you are the last one there, and then talk about how really we need to have a discussion first because we have to have at least one admin to, to keep the, the group alive. And so at that point, we need to question whether the group should stay alive at all. I didn't come up with any decisions about what to do about that other than to say, we need to have a discussion. So I figured that's at least a step in the right direction. We can get more formal later if we, anybody has any brilliant ideas, but anybody have any questions on this? Okay, any objection to approving? I already approved it. Yep, okay, cool. Thank you. I also objected. Thank you guys, let's see. Um, Actually, Klaus, we have about four minutes left. Do you want to talk to your PR that you just opened? Even though we can't approve it because it's too soon. Do you want to talk yes. to the PR that you opened? Where was it? Did it go? Well, I, um, as we discussed, I think two weeks ago or something like this, um, I added some section to the, or a paragraph to the um, primer. I think it was this uh, section about creating events. So they were already, um, was already a discussion in the in the primer before that uh, about um, what an intermediary does and or in which case it's a new event so about different cases uh, creating events and so I thought it might fit in here um, and that there is might be the special case of, of um, creating nested events and that in those cases uh, the data content type uh, should be taken care of that not this cloud events plus JSON or whatever format is used for the inner event can be used. And then I added the example we had also in the GitHub issue. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, it's just, uh, I mean, um, as I'm not a native speaker, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to correct my wording whenever someone has some things I should correct. Any questions or comments on this? That just on the face of it, that just looks a bit odd. I, I wouldn't know if, is the type of that event my event or is it cool event? I, I'm it's, not sure if I take one of these in isolation or how I would know. It is two events, that's the point. So there is an inner event of type cool event that is nested into an outer event uh, of type my event. Yeah, this, this is correct. And the important part here is that the content type of the, for the, um, as it is shown in the outer event is application JSON and not uh, cloud events plus JSON. Hey, obviously, like I said, we're not going to approve this today, but I wanted to get it out there for people to be thinking about it and, and look it over. The the challenge here is that it's um, the whole nesting issue is, is quite um, confusing in the beginning. So to just add some short section that explains it is, is really challenging for me. Hmm. But I, I felt the primer is already very long, so I didn't want to to add a long explanation. My only comment is if you can wrap it at 80 characters, I'd appreciate that. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I thought I did, but uh, somehow I'm still struggling with uh, um, visual code, I guess. So, so the more I actually, I get it now. Okay, sorry for that mental brain fart for a second. Um, is there an argument here that if you're gonna do this, you might as well, or we might as well standardize what the 
type is, what the CE type is to represent a body of another cloud event in this situation? I think it's dependent on your application. So like, for example, in a pipeline, you might have a follow-up where you want to have the follow-up be structured and the invoking request be binary. I wonder okay. if we could use the data schema. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think with that, we're technically almost, oh, it just turned one o'clock on my clock. So let me just do a quick roll, roll call. Um, Doug, are you still on the call? I'm here. All right, cool. And Eric? Hello. Hello. And whoa, how did I do that? <laughs> Ray? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Now, if That's you can give me your company name, I appreciate that. Um, yes. And um, oh, RxM. RxM. Okay, cool. And Hamza? Are you there? Okay, if you can come off mute, just let me know. Anybody else I missed for roll call? Uh, Lino. Oh, there you go. He's there. Okay. Yeah, uh, if you, Hamza, if you can give me your, your full name and the company you're with, and that's chat, I'd appreciate that just for the attendee list. Otherwise, I think everybody else is free to go unless anybody wants to stick around for the SDK call immediately after this one. So we'll give you every good people a minute or so to, to hang up, and then we'll start the SDK call. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to look, Doug, if that's okay. Of course. The more the merrier. I don't expect it to be a long call, but we shall see. We've been surprised before. No, I have to go back and double check. Linux Basic, who was that again? I apologize. Linus. Linux. Yeah, yes, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm time boxed to like 10, 15 minutes because I have to run to another meeting. So I wouldn't really put myself on the list. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. All right, when are we going to get started? Uh, any topics for discussion? I have a slight one. It's, a, it's another reoccurring theme, I guess. Uh, I would like to break apart the Golang SDK client piece. Uh, I, because it's all donated to the CNCF, I think it has to live in a repo inside a cloud event somewhere, but I think it probably should get pulled out of the, the SDK that deals in encodings. So I'm sorry, say that again. Which part do you want to pull out? The client. Okay. Anybody have any comment on that? Sorry, not the, not the CLI. The, oh. uh, I want to break out the client piece. Um, it's, it's not a command line client. It's the, the Go interface client that deals in events. OK. All right, so there's like, there's two layers to it. There's the protocol bindings that converts cloud event conical forms into uh, the bits that should be going on the wire. And then there's this other piece that leverages those to, um, to do like kind of runtime uh, interactions. Okay, and, you want to do the, and you want to do this because it'd be easier for people to consume it or for some other reason? I, I think that the, the target audience for most people would be uh, leverage some like some of the convenience methods that help you take the conical form of an event and turn it into something that's for a transport or a protocol and not take the client wholesale. So 
it, at the moment, the, cl the cloud events SDK is structured so that those two things are decoupled, but I, there's more choices that the client makes that aren't really in alignment with what cloud events says. Could these can be, you give uh, more examples of that? Oh, sorry. Scott didn't hear John's question. No, I did not hear that one. He, he's asking oh, for sorry. more examples of that. Uh, well, so for example, um, one of the goals of the client side of the code was several, just like three lines of Go code and you've got an up and running receiver that takes in it's basically like a function framework. And I've, I've been waffling between like, is that overstepping or not for the, what the guise of cloud events is. And I, there's integrators like Amazon that are interested in the SDK that are only interested in the parts that are the, the encoders where you take a conical form and you turn it into the, the version for a protocol. And there's the optimizations we can make that we, we never pop it out into the conical event, just sort of like how when you in Go, if you're interacting with a HTTP, you get uh, the uh, you get requests and responses, and it's your job to like decide if you want to take the the buffer from the incoming request and do something with it. I'm not really giving that choice in my client. I see. Yeah. So, so I, if if I'm understanding you correctly, I have that same question about the those two Rust uh, SDK uh, repos. Right. One one talks about being a microkernel and sort of it's got all these pieces, and the other one's a lot simpler. Yeah. Right? So I think I, I think I think you're bringing up an issue that's kind of broader than just the Go SDK. Right. If this is something, you know, from from sort of an engineering consumption perspective, that that should be talked about, kind of as a best practice or something like that. Yeah, we, and we touched on this a little bit when we were, we updated the doc about what the SDK's min requirements are. Uh, but I, I, you know, I I did more than what that doc even says inside the Golang SDK. And so if other repos are looking at this and they're saying, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do all the encoding bits, but I'm also going to do some like opinionated client bits. It, it gets a little confusing for people. Yeah. It, it, uh, Mark's asking if there is multiple packages. It already does that. I, but I'm, like the simple Rust case, I think that there's a, a market for like this core, just convert things, like give me a request and turn it into some sort of other thing that I can transfer around that's fairly fast versus fairly easy, which is the goal of the client. How often would the two repos be used together though? So the client would depend directly on the core part. Right. Like um, the core part would be uh, probably blocking and take opinions about how, um, how like if it, everything is unidirectional, the client might choose to uh, allow responses for certain integrations of transports or uh, protocols like HTTP. So I've, uh, in it, so in the in the C sharp SDK, so I have I have a second repo as well that sits on the side and that I haven't published yet, um, because we obviously also need to have product specific integration and that have no place in the in the CNCF repo. So I'm trying to figure out what what a home for that is. Right, uh, that's that's my issue too, and and it's it's even worse because now it's all in the cloud events library and it it's like technically donated to the CNCF. So I can't just like push that back into some other non CNCF project or repo. So, so my, so I have, so what I've done, what I have done from the start is I have this core thing, which is um, 
just the cloud event. So I have, I have this cloud event attributes class, which is the, the, the thing you can't really see, but that deals with all the version management and, and all this, what we needed while we were still working on it. And now we have a bit, little bit of legacy, if not much. Um, but that class deals with effectively the, the data model handling. And then there's the cloud event per se, which is kind of a wrapper around this and has a strongly typed 1.0 uh, uh, surface area. And, um, and then I have, and that's kind of mostly what you deal with in the SDK. And that's what for the product integrations, that's the thing that I come for effectively um, because they map, since I don't have like pure MQP, a pure MQP surface, um, I can't, I need to go and map to the product SDKs. So I literally just pull that, I li literally just pull that, uh, that uh, package for the cloud events class and then do all my mappings to the transports, uh, then effectively separately um, into the product SDKs. And the, the cloud events SDK per se has you know, common mappings to um, the most popular SDKs in .NET land. So it knows how to map to the HTTP request in, in .NET um, and to the HTTP listeners. And there's two versions of this. And then otherwise I've, I've taken some, some popular SDKs. Um, but these, these product bindings, the transport bindings is something that I'm gonna add effectively in further external libraries which then use, um, and that's specific to C-sharp, use the extension mechanism where I can effectively just add a, um, I can add a to cloud event to, you know, the transport message uh, um, class. But I kind of have this, I have this core that this core class, which is really the cloud event SDK, which are then re reusing in, 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 the, in the further external libraries that do the transport bindings. Yeah. And then I have four, four, I have, I chose only to embed really like the, the thing that everybody needs, HTTP, into that core library. And then I have extra assemblies for MQTT and for MQP and for Kafka. Yeah, I, 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 do, I do a similar thing, but the, those extra integrations are in the repo and they're yeah, in absolutely. separate directories so that they only get linked if they are imported. Yeah, and, and I have everything in the same repo as, as long as it's product independent. And then everything that is product dependent, I still need to find a home for. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, so, it's, but the, the question about the, you know, should there be this like client thing that kind of oversteps what the cloud events spec says live in this repo or should it be a, a separate thing? Um, so it depends for what, right? So it's, it's arguably <laughs> um, for the Canadian is at this weird place, right? Which is, it, you could look at it from, depending on who, where you sit, um, that is something that belongs or doesn't belong into, into a CNCF repo. Right. So that's, that's something that theoretically because of the status of k-natives should really live somewhere else and then that yields a native a, a a bit of a split in here's a here's a universally useful thing for how you express and handle the cloud event in in uh, in go and then he, here's another set of classes that um, then deal with that uh, do an integration to k-native and those are then mentioned we we have that. Right. That's all over the place, right? There's nothing that's K-native specific in the Golang SDK. The the only thing that is leaky is some of the runtime object model that K-native supports mm. is is enabled by the Cloud Events SDK. Mm. You could do other like w way other uh, way, uh, a lot of other things too, but um, you know. This SDK is the thing that drives a lot of the uh, eventing pieces inside mm -hmm. of uh, Knative. Yeah, I don't want to police it. I just, I just want to kind of the, the philosophy of that. Since you were talking about the philosophy of all this, I just want to share what I think about it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, it kind of sounds like the takeaway might be, what do I want? 
doesn't sound like anyone's concerned about the client. So maybe I just leave it. Yeah. Okay. We um we had a meeting, uh Slinky Developer and I. Uh, is he here? Not here. No. Um we we are making plans to do the uh V2 migration, which uh, does some some more optimizations about uh, th there's a lot of use cases where if let's say you're a piece of middleware and you you want to route an event that you've delivered and, and maybe filtered from the import to the export I the um, at the moment I I always go to the conical form and there's been work that allows buffering and um, like buffer copies between two encodings. So like it can read straight from HTTP's buffer in and send it to the NATs out. So you avoid the intermediate uh, version of that object. Oh, okay. Which gives like a 10x improvement a lot of the times if the message gets, if there isn't any other thing to do with the message. I would, love aware to, scenarios. I would love to have that kind of time. That, yeah, right. Well, I'm not doing this work, sort of, but. Uh, <laughs> I would love to have those kinds of resources. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Anyway, that's just a heads up. We, we're, uh, the goal is to get the V2 out by KubeCon, and I, th I think we can get there. It's going to be a lot of work. Oh my God, I can't type today. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. Any other topics for discussion? Okay. Um, okay, so I, oh, anybody go ahead. representing Java? Say it again? Anybody representing Java? Uh, I don't think Fabio is oh. on the call. Actually, that's a really good question. Uh, Doug, have you worked on, is there a table of the owners? for all of these SDKs? That's funny you should ask. Um, let me show you something. I have this, I haven't put it to, so I have that. Um, now, uh, what I've been doing recently was opening a pull request in each repo to identify the leader for that repo. So someone knows who to go poke if they have any questions. Yep. Um, I. I was gonna put this list into the main readme of the cloud events repo at some point. I just so people don't have to go to each individual uh, repo directly. Yeah, sure. Um, Here, here's my email address. Um, okay. Man, this is, and we'll update it if it ever changes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, but the one thing I can't remember we didn't, did we talk about the Ruby SDK on the C8 call? I don't think we did. No, it? no, we didn't. Yeah, I, I was gonna propose, oh no, we did, we did. And Mark suggested that rather than archiving it, we just change the title to say, no one's working on it, if you're interested, volunteer. And I did that already. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, so we did. Yeah, so I think the only action item left for me is to actually put this someplace global. So. Um, I, th I think it's, we probably should have a template of uh, some kind of information of the owners in each, like you've been adding. Yeah. Um, bum, 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 bum. I can work on, or yeah, I mean, I can work on what that template would be and put it someplace global and then have each repo owner copy it into their in their readme, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Like add that to the requirements of writing an SDK. You you have to have this file, and it uh, it tells people how to contact you. The reason why I asked that question was that uh, uh, apparently, as I just learned over I am from uh, elsewhere, um, is that uh, Confluent is uh, triggered enough by the existence of the Java SDK. Uh, and the Kafka binding that they have look, take look, uh, taken a look at it and they are very unhappy with it. And so um, it, 
apparently they're going to bring a PR to uh, bring the Kafka uh, part of the SDK in order. That'd be cool. Yes, I, and you know if if that's if that's what it is, you know if we just put code there and the code kind of half works and then the vendors come and fix it, that's uh, you know that's not a bad start. No, that is good. I have a to do to support Kafka as well. So before I forget though, Clemens, um, what title do you want again? <laughs> I can't remember what you said, what you called yourself. He's a, he's it's like master of hearsay. I'm a principal architect. If you don't want to have the chief messenger. Chief, which one do you want officially on the website? Uh, I think I've used chief messenger with the CSDF before. <laughs> okay. I just gotta remember chief or chef, one of the two. Okay. Chief. I always misspell that. <laughs> okay. Actually I think I think last time I asked you this, you said principal architect, but that's okay. You know, pick either one. Okay. Okay. Anything else you guys want to talk about? That's all. That's all. all right. Cool. In that case it's lunchtime for me. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's not for me. It's seven. 20. Maybe I'm going to, if I go upstairs, I get something to eat. We'll, we shall see. <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay. Have a good one. Talk to everybody later. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.